It is Wednesday, August 31st, 2022. We are at the end of August tonight, and we're here together tonight to study from the Word of God. We're in Genesis chapter 16, so if you want to have a Bible and be turning with me there, that would be great if we could be together in Genesis chapter 16. We'll be there in just a few moments. And we're glad that you've joined us tonight. We're glad that you're here, either on the phone or on the internet, on YouTube. We're uh, glad that you found the Bible study, and we would invite you to join us in person this coming Lord's Day morning at 9.30 for a Bible study, and then we get together at 10.30 for worship. And if you have any questions about what you see or hear in tonight's class, uh, give us a call or send a text to 608-224-0274 or send an email to fourlakeschurch at gmail.com, and we would definitely love uh, to hear from you. Uh, you guys have done such a good job over the past several weeks bringing in school supplies for Kennedy Elementary. This is something we've done for a number of years now, so thank you again. Thank you so much for doing that. I'm putting the list of items on the screen once again tonight, as I did last week. These were in the bulletin several weeks ago, and again, if you want to take a screenshot or actually take a picture of your TV or device or whatever works for you, uh, this would be a good opportunity to do that as a shopping list over the next uh, week or so. And if you have any questions about this, get in touch with Ann Grodi, and she'd be glad to help you out there. Uh, but thanks again for your help with this. I'm looking forward to being able to send those over to the school for those kids who are getting started here really soon. Tonight we get back to Genesis. So Genesis is the book of beginnings written mainly by Moses, and we've been looking at a man by the name of Abram for the past several weeks. Abram is chosen by God to leave his homeland to travel to an unknown land, and he obeys the Lord. He does this, and over the past few chapters, God has made some promises to this man, and he has now renewed those promises that Abram will have many descendants, that they will inherit this land, and that his descendants would end up being a blessing to the whole world. And over the past few weeks, we've also seen Abram try to help God out a little bit. I think that'd be a good way of describing that, maybe by finding some workarounds. So God has made some promises, and these promises really don't look like they're going to be fulfilled. And so Abram is trying to find some way of getting these things done. And we'll see that again tonight with some disastrous consequences, not only for Abram and his family immediately, but really throughout the rest of world history. So let's jump right into this by looking at Genesis chapter 16, verses 1 through 6. Genesis 16, 1 through 6. The entire chapter is only 16 verses long, so it's a shorter chapter than usual, so tonight's class might be a little bit shorter than it normally is. But let's look at the first paragraph. This is Genesis chapter 16, verses 1 through 6. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maid whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, Now behold, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Please go into my maid, perhaps I will obtain children through her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. After Abram had lived ten years in the land of Canaan, Abram's wife Sarai took Hagar the Egyptian, her maid, and gave her to her husband Abram as his wife. He went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her sight. And Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong done me be upon you. I gave my maid into your arms, but when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her sight. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, Behold, your maid is in your power. Do to her what is good in your sight. So Sarai treated her harshly. And she fled from her presence. Up in verse 1, we have the reminder that Sarai still had not borne any children. And later in this chapter, we'll find that Abram is 86 years old. So it's now been more than 10 years, as I understand it, since God made the promise that Abram would have many descendants. So the clock is ticking. So here's this guy, 86 years old. I think Sarai was about 10 years younger than he is. And so they just don't see how this will be possible. And this is where we're introduced to Sarai's Egyptian maid a woman by the name of Hagar. And remember, Abram and Sarai had spent some time in Egypt, hadn't they, due to the famine. And so it's possible that Hagar joined them at that point. Some of the commentaries were speculating that perhaps this woman was a gift from Pharaoh and that uh, Pharaoh gave uh, Abram and Sarai uh, not only things, but also people as they left the land of Egypt after that famine. But we're not really told exactly how she joins this uh, family or this household. She might have come on board either before or after their journey to Egypt. We don't know. 
But the point for us to note in this passage is that now it's Sarai's turn to try to find a workaround. So instead of having children the old-fashioned way, uh, Sarai suggests that uh, Abram try to have children with Hagar. And I hope we notice how Sarai makes her argument. And it's just interesting to me that she starts by putting this on God, doesn't she? Now behold, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. In other words, this is God's fault. God made this promise, and then he did this to me. He made sure I couldn't have children. So God is uh, intervening in this situation by preventing me from having children. Well, that's the farthest thing from the truth. Um, or maybe she's saying that this is part of God's plan. So since God has prevented me from having children, maybe this is what God has in mind. And so they're reading God's mind. I think we would say they are sinning presumptuously. Uh, surely God wouldn't mind that kind of argument there. And so the other part of this is that Sarai is turning to what was a common practice back at that time, the head of the household having children with slaves or servants in that household. And they would then be brought into the family, they would get inheritance rights and so on. So perhaps she allowed the culture around her to change her instead of the other way around, but they're definitely not doing what God has uh, told them to do here. And in all of this, I think we see shadows from Adam and Eve in the garden. I don't know if you picked up on that. I think it's kind of an interesting parallel. Like Eve, Sarai takes on something of a spiritual leadership role in the family between the two of them. And like Adam, Abram goes along with it, at least at the end of verse 2, and Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. So as we noted a few weeks ago when we studied Adam and Eve and almost some identical wording there, not that it's wrong for husbands to listen to their wives. That's not wrong at all. But the problem here is, first of all, Sarai is proposing a shortcut to God's plan. But then secondly, nowhere do we see Abram or Sarai checking in with God about this new plan. It would have been so easy at this point for one of them to have at least consulted God about this. Dear God, what do we do? It's been so long. You know, what, what are our next steps here? But notice we don't see any of that in this passage. So I would suggest a very... Uh, practical, maybe a first application of this passage then, is the reminder to check in with God. Uh, instead of making stuff up on our own, there is certainly a value to prayer and Bible study. There's an old saying that goes something like this, it will never be the will of God if it goes against the Word of God. And so the idea here is check back in with the Word of God. And if you have some feeling you need to do something, and if that doesn't match up with the Word of God, you need to rethink that and go back and restudy that until you have certainty from the Scripture itself. And so this decision that they make to bypass God's Word in a sense, that'll actually, as I mentioned earlier, will lead to centuries of unnecessary pain and conflict in the human race. Well, in verse 3, we find that they have now been in the land of Canaan for 10 years. We also find that Abram and Sarai execute the plan with Hagar, so they get this done. And Hagar conceives, and once she does, the mood in that household changes almost immediately, doesn't it? With uh, Sarai now despising her servant Hagar. I would assume there's some jealousy here, and I think we could understand this. This woman now has a relationship with my husband, and she conceived, but I can't. Uh, that kind of thing. But I'm guessing it would get pretty uncomfortable rather quickly if we could just try to imagine putting ourselves back in that situation. And so Hagar then is despised in Sarah's sight. Sarah, I just cannot stand to be around this woman. And here they are uh, living in the same household. Well, in the rest of this paragraph, Sarah seems to try to shift the blame again. So remember at the beginning, she's blaming God for this. And now she talks to Abraham. May the wrong done to me be upon you. So now remember, this was all whose idea at the beginning? This was Sarah's idea. And Abram, obviously, he went along with it. He shouldn't have done that. But he obviously plays a, a rather large role here. And he, obviously, looking back on it, should have said no to this plan. No, God has promised us children. He didn't promise me and Hagar children. He promised us children. But Sarai is now mad. So she sees that uh, she's been done wrong. Uh, but that wrong has been done to her. She is the victim here as she sees it. She's now on the outside of this relationship. At least this is the way it seems to her at the moment. So Abram and Hagar have something special together that uh, Abram and Sarai do not have together. And now Sarah feels, or Sarai feels that she is despised in Hagar's sight. And so it's kind of interesting to me that the feeling is mutual, isn't it? They don't like each other. This is a bad situation. Both of them feel despised by one another 
in this absolutely messed up family situation. And I, I know a lot of us have been through some kind of tense family moments. And I know a lot of you have some strange family relationships and you've had some stress and you may be going through stress right now. But I'm just saying, if we look at these few verses, it would be hard to top this. So uh, an infertile couple and a, a slave coming in and bearing children and the fight that goes on there just was a, a horrible thing to live through. And so Sarai then almost seems to put this on God. May the Lord judge between you and me. Well, that's quite a way to stop an argument between a husband and a wife. You know, God will strike you or God will take care of the situation. Well, that's kind of the point that they're at here. And so as I understand this, Sarai now wants God to fix this. So she had caused the problem by not listening to God, by not consulting God. But now she's appealing to God to make it better without any real repentance on her part. Does that ever happen today? You know, God, how could you allow this thing to happen to me? All the while, that person has been completely ignoring God at every step of the way. Uh, obviously, that does still happen today, and that seems to be what Sarai is doing here. In verse 6, though, Abram comes pretty close <laughs> to just backing away slowly, doesn't he? This is not my problem. Whatever you want to do, you do it. She's your servant. She's your maid. Um, this is your deal. And so Sarai then, she takes this as permission to treat Hagar harshly. She abuses this woman in some way, verbally, physically, maybe both, just making her life as miserable as she possibly can. And she's got some power to do that. And Hagar gets out of there. Uh, Hagar flees from Sarai's presence. Well, let's continue tonight with Genesis 16, verses 7 through 10. Genesis chapter 16, verses 7 through 10. Now the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to Shur. He said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? And she said, I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress Sarai. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress and submit yourself to her authority. Moreover, the angel of the Lord said to her, I will greatly multiply your descendants so that they will be too many to count. Well, how interesting that the angel of the Lord basically chases Hagar down in the wilderness, chasing her in a good way, not the kind of chasing that Sarai would have done. You know, even though Hagar is not the designated mother in that promise that was originally made to Abraham, but God still cares about what happens to this woman. So this woman is not in the plan. She gets inserted into this plan. But instead of just ignoring that, instead of allowing her to suffer at this moment, God is with her and takes some steps to enter into that relationship. I would note here that there are times when the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament seems to perhaps refer to Jesus uh, before he came in human form, the pre-incarnate uh, son of God, we might say it's been labeled in various ways. We can't really nail it down in this passage. It's pretty close. It's about as close as it gets. So I'm just noting the possibility here. But this angel, this messenger, approaches Hagar and asks her, where have you come from and where are you going? So I'm going to ask, does that question remind you of anything? Where have you come from? Where are you going? Where are you? Do you remember that back in the earlier part of Genesis, God approaching Adam in the garden and asking, where are you? And as we noted then, obviously God knew exactly where Adam was, but he was asking this for Adam's benefit, not for his own benefit. God already knew the answer to that question. Well, in the same way, this seems to be what's happening here. God is obviously concerned about this woman. He knows where she has been, where she's coming from and where she is going. He knows this. Um, but I would point out here that God is concerned, and, and in fact, God calls this woman by name. So God knows her name, and he sees her suffering. And I would want us to notice that this is in contrast to Abram and Sarai, who, if I remember correctly, have only referred to this woman as the maid up to this point. Think about how insulting that is. The help. She's the slave. She's the maid. They don't even call her by name. And so there is sometimes quite a contrast, it seems, between the way we treat people and the way God sees people. And even in our everyday lives today, I know we don't have slaves or servants, but in a sense, aren't there a lot of people who serve us on a daily basis? 
We go out to a store, we check out at a gas station, we do have literal servers at restaurants. So how do we treat those people? You know, Do we see them as people with a name, people worthy of respect, or do we kind of order them around kind of like Abram and Sarai were doing with Hagar? Hagar. So maybe kind of a practical application there, that God sees people personally as individual souls, and he knows their names. So he knows our name. He knows the names of all the people we interact with on a daily basis. And there's something I think we can learn from that, that we need to have the same kind of concern. Uh, nevertheless, Hagar answers. She's fleeing from Sarai, apparently heading back toward her home in Egypt. Uh, this is in that direction, the wilderness of Shur. So she's made it roughly, I think, 70 miles at this point. But here the angel tells her to go back and to submit to Sarai's authority. So she's pregnant, um, kind of vulnerable here, and apparently heading for home, maybe to try to find some relative, somebody who can take care of her down here through the rest of this process. Uh, but the angel says, nope, go back. Go back to Abram and Sarai, and you need to submit yourself to Sarai's authority. Beyond this, the angel now says that he will multiply her descendants as well. And it's interesting that the angel makes this promise, that he will do this. And I think this is one more reason to believe that this particular angel uh, may in fact be more than an angel. This angel is certainly sounding a lot like the Lord God himself. So whoever this being is, he is in a position to make a promise like this, and he'll go on to say more. So let's continue with Genesis 16, verses 11 and 12. Genesis chapter 16, verses 11 and 12. The angel of the Lord said to her further, Behold, you are with child, and you will bear a son, and you shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has given heed to your affliction. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand will be against him, and he will live to the east of all his brothers. So in addition to telling her to go back to Sarai, in addition to promising many descendants, uh, the angel now reveals even more that she will bear a son. Remember, this is in the days before ultrasound, so it's it could be boy or girl, got a 50-50 shot here. Uh, but you will bear a son, and then he tells her to name the child Ishmael. And again, how does this sound familiar? An angel telling a woman that she's expecting, and this is what you need to name the child. We've seen this a number of times in scripture as well, haven't we? Well, Ishmael means God hears. So God then has heard Hagar's crying in the wilderness, it seems. And even though Hagar is not a part of that promise given to Abram, she is now. So she's kind of been sucked into the drama of this family, most likely against her will. And God, through this angel, or maybe God himself here, promises that he will take care of her. In verse 12, though, we find that Ishmael will be a wild donkey of a man. Well, not always a compliment to call somebody a donkey. Uh, what character traits might we associate with a donkey? What do we think of when we think of a donkey? I think most of us think stubborn, and that may be part of it. And we think of donkeys as being stubborn creatures. I think the other kind of concept out there tied to donkeys at that time was kind of a creature that lived over, kind of on its own out in the wilderness and kind of stubborn, uh, ruggedly independent kind of thing, perhaps. But Ishmael will be like that, whatever that is. He'll be stubborn, kind of an outdoors, kind of living away out in the wilderness kind of thing. So he will be against everyone. Ishmael will apparently be something of a troublemaker, and he will live to the east of his family. So let's conclude tonight with the last little section here. This is Genesis 16, verses 13 through 16. Genesis 16, verses 13 through 16. Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, you are a God who sees. For she said, Have I even remained alive here after seeing him? Therefore the well was called Bir Lahai Roy. Behold, it is between Kadesh and Bered. So Hagar bore Abram a son. And Abram called the name of his son, whom Hagar bore Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to him. Up in verse 13, Hagar is amazed that God has heard her prayer. And so God not only hears and speaks to the men, 
The heads of the families, as we discussed a week or so ago, remember the patriarchal age is that time when God communicated primarily through heads of households. But God also hears and speaks to her. And that's pretty impressive. God is speaking to this woman, a slave, basically a single mother, hiding on the run in this far-off place in the wilderness, and she survives her conversation with the Lord. This is shocking to her. I can't believe I've talked to God and I've lived, is kind of her attitude here. And I think this is one more indication that this angel is almost certainly more than an angel. So she renames the place Bir Lahai Roy, meaning the well of the living one who sees me. That's an awesome name for a place. Uh, in verse 15, Hagar bears this son. It's interesting to me that Abram names the son, but he uses the name that was given to Hagar by the Lord. So what does that tell us? I think it indicates that there has been some communication between them on this. I can imagine Hagar coming back to Sarai, submitting herself to her master, but then also telling Abram, you're never going to believe this, but on the run... I met God in the wilderness, and that's why I'm back. And that would certainly be convincing, it seems. And so at the end of this, we find Abram is 86 years old when Ishmael is born. Well, in terms of application of this passage, have we noticed that we start this chapter with Abram and Sarai basically disobeying God through a lack of faith, trying to find a way around the promise? Like, there's no way this can happen, so we need to do this on our own and find a workaround. And Sarai basically disobeying God by trying to to just do whatever she needs to do to get this done on her own, which is weird right there. Why would you disobey God for one of God's promises to come true? That doesn't make any sense at all. And yet, don't we sometimes do the same thing today? But I just find it interesting. The chapter begins with Abram and Sarai, Abram, the father of the faithful, being pretty unfaithful by trying to find a way to do their own thing. And by the time we get to the end of the chapter, we have Hagar, a foreign Egyptian slave being the only one who is truly obedient in this situation. And that's something I don't think I've considered looking at this chapter before, the transition that happens. So we have the disobedience of God's chosen man and his wife, and then we have the faithful obedience of Hagar going back to a terrible situation at God's command. And so she is obeying. So she obeys by going back to a very uncomfortable and even abusive relationship with Sarai. So there's certainly something to be said for Hagar's faith at this point. And this is where we leave it tonight. Abram is 86 years old. He's once again tried to find a workaround to help God out with the promise. So now he's got a son, but it is not the son of promise. This is not a son born of Sarai. And this son will actually complicate things quite a bit over the next several chapters and really throughout the rest of world history. As I understand it, many Arabs trace their history to Ishmael. They consider, at least some do, consider Ishmael to be their forefather. Well, have we seen some conflict between Abraham's people on one side of the family and the other? Some conflict between Jews and Arabs? Have we seen that here and there through the years? Absolutely we have, and I would suggest that that starts right here in Genesis chapter 16. But thank you for being with us tonight. Hope to see you this coming Lord's Day at 9.30 a.m. We're getting back to our new study of Isaiah. And I've been kind of surprised that we didn't jump in right away with Isaiah chapter 1, but I am so thankful that we didn't. I am so thankful for the background studies over the past couple weeks. I have learned some valuable lessons about the prophets over the past few weeks. I didn't realize the role of the prophets had shifted as it had. I just hadn't thought about that before. So I'm thankful for Caleb's leadership in that class. And so hope to see you for that at 930. And then after class on Sunday, we do plan on coming together at 1030 for a worship assembly as we continue with the fifth of the eight Beatitudes. But let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are a God who sees You're a God who cares. You're a God who knows all of us by name. You see what we endure even when no one around us seems to care or notice. Thank you, Father, for your concern, and thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.